When you first hear that there's an organization called Focus on the Family, the optimistic side of you, if that exists for any of us anymore, might think it's an organization for good. Maybe they provide free childcare for people who need it, advocate for guaranteed parental leave, or try to stop the outrageously high infant mortality rate in the United States. Unfortunately, if these were any of your guesses, I hate to break your little optimistic heart, but you're wrong. Focus on the Family is basically the antithesis of everything I just said. They're an anti-LGBTQ plus religious group that works to undermine the validity of same-sex marriage, prevent same-sex couples from adoption, and still believes in conversion therapy. The only family they want to help, even though they're not doing much helping in the first place, are for cisgender heterosexual ones. In case, of course, you want an abortion, then they aren't trying to help you either, like at all. Founded in 1977 as a small radio show by the infamous James C. Dobson, the original organization focused primarily on talking about religion and the ideals of the traditional family. In addition to somehow becoming the last people to ever interview Ted Bundy before he was killed too. I'm not sure how that happened, but that's a thing too. But as time went on, the organization grew and grew and grew to the homophobic political and social powerhouse it is today. Nowadays, the new leader, Jim Daly, claims that he's trying to take a kinder approach to the group's mission. Basically, he's not going to call gay people literally Satan like his predecessor, James Dobson did. But his approach isn't all rainbows and butterflies. After all, the group's whole focus is still to dismantle the LGBTQ organizations and abortion rights. Can't expect it to be the most stand-up organization. Today, they lean on the horrifying groomer rhetoric that once again has reared its ugly head in the conversation and works to dismantle any type of hope for equality for transgender folks, especially when it has anything to do with sports. While their messaging is still massively spread through blogs and radio spots, their social impact is nothing compared to their carefully developed political influence. The group even gives out voting guides to its supporters, which considering the current political climate is nothing short of terrifying. While many thought that Focus on the Family could be taking its last breath of life back in the early 2000s when it experienced layoffs and a stark decline in its revenues, it sprang back to life with a vengeance in the following years. Now they train people to become politicians focused on passing Christian legislation. They fund crisis pregnancy centers and they provide controversial conversion therapy without blinking an eye. Yes, Focus on the Family is alive and well, and this is their story. Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we'll be talking about the global Christian ministry dedicated to helping families thrive. Focus on the family. And yes, that is their description of themselves. Notice how it doesn't say heterosexual traditional families, but that's really what they mean. From the beginning, Focus on the Family blasted into the public consciousness with the key mission of protecting traditional families. And the leader of that mission was the now infamous James C. Dobson. When he first developed Focus on the Family, it was merely started as a radio talk show. You know, those hyper-religious ones that you hear two seconds of when you're flipping through the radio trying to find actual music while driving through the Bible Belt. A little something like that. But as time went on, the radio broadcast went from playing once in a blue moon to being everywhere. In fact, it's been played on over 5,000 stations in 150 languages and has a global audience of roughly 200 million people. That is some insane influence. It's actually so popular that it was inducted into the Radio Hall of Fame back in 2008. Never in a million years would I have guessed that fact if I didn't read it with my own eyes. So how did he get his fame? Well, part of it comes from the unlikeliest of sources, Ted Bundy. And yes, you heard me right, Ted Bundy. Right before his execution, the Christian radio host somehow got the bid for the last interview with the serial killer. And not shockingly, this electrifying interview blew up. Over the next year, Dobson would receive over 38,000 requests for his pre-execution interview where Bundy claimed, coincidentally, that it was pornography that had guided and shaped his sexual violence later in life. This admission seemed a little too ironic considering Dobson's overwhelming message of pornography being one of the roots of all evil. Now he had the most infamous serial killer at the time admitting to it causing his sheer brutality and wickedness. It was very convenient. And I'm not the only one that feels like this admission was just a little too perfect for Dobson's messaging either. As the interview came out, many psychologists reacted unfavorably to the interview and claimed that Dobson was using it in an attempt to link pornography to violent crimes. After all, Bundy was known as a chameleon who routinely said whatever the person he was talking to wanted to hear. And to add to that, Dobson seemed to be incredibly leading throughout the whole interview. He seems to tell Ted Bundy how he feels instead of asking. 
and after the interview is over, proudly proclaims that pornography often leads to violent crime while citing research that doesn't actually say that at all. A favorite pastime for him and his organization, by the way. It's no wonder that psychologists would be wary of the serial killer's supposed confession. But Dobson denied it all and said nothing like that was happening. He would never purposefully interview a serial killer known for agreeing with whoever he was talking to so he could push his own agenda. That would just be insane, or maybe just par for the course for him. Even so, he did send over half a million dollars of the proceeds from that one interview over to another anti-pornography group, though he claimed none of it went back to focus on the family. And sure, money may not have gone back to focus on the family, but the notoriety definitely did, and they ran with it. Suddenly, there and by association, James Dobson's notoriety absolutely exploded. Maybe this is when a little light bulb went off in his head. If he did controversial things and said controversial shit, his organization, his radio show, and his viewpoints would be catapulted into the public eye. Most of his many best-selling books were pretty mundane, just a typical pop psychologist that gave simple advice on things like romantic relationships and sibling relationships. Think Dr. Phil, but somehow worse. But his public appearances and personal musings were a little more shocking. In the years following his infamous interview, he began appearing on what he would probably call his secular shows, like Larry King Live back when it was on CNN. There, he gave some very interesting opinions on homosexuality. With a background in child development and psychology, he's a literal doctor, unfortunately. He uses this to his advantage to make his twisted viewpoints sound authoritative and backed up by science, even though they very much are not. To him, being gay isn't a choice, like what most other hyper-Christian organizations seem to constantly preach. For a Christian organizational leader who believes in conversion therapy, this seems like a different viewpoint. So what does he believe? Well, it's only a bit complicated. And I quote here, and this is kind of a block quote, so just hang tight, but it's all one quote, I assure you. Apparently, he believes that being gay comes from an identity crisis that occurs too early to remember it where a boy is born with an attachment to his mother and she is everything to him for about 18 months. And between 18 and five years, he needs to detach from her and to reattach to his father. It's a very important developmental task. And if his dad is gone or abusive or disinterested, or maybe there's just not a good fit there, what's he going to do? So basically he claims that being gay comes from a poor attachment to fathers and an overdependence on mothers. And I don't know where that actually comes from, but definitely not from science, but that's what he believes. And that's why he thinks therapy is an option. He believes that being gay is just an identity crisis that can be fixed with some very intense counseling. Of course, we know that isn't true and he sure as hell doesn't. We'll talk more about focus on the family and their conversion therapy in just a bit though. For now, more on their founder. The fact that this type of conversation was so open on secular television is already wild, but what he did when Obama became president takes the fucking cake. So when Obama was elected in 2008, Focus on the Family decided to post a fake letter detailing what an Obama administration would mean for the country. And before you say anything, yes, it's absolutely as insane as you're probably thinking right now. So let's just go through some of the few like main points, shall we? Grab your popcorn, my little triangle friends. Now, first off, they claim that every Christian talk show would be shut down by 2010. And that's obviously not what happened. There's actually probably more now than there were before. So thanks, Obama. And I'm just kidding. But the point is they certainly did not disappear. But that's maybe a little too easy of an example. I'm just starting you off slowly. Let's go for another. The letter also believed that pornography would be literally displayed on newsstands. And that's hilarious to me for multiple reasons. For one, why would Obama being president lead to this? Also, who the hell still uses newsstands? And okay, rapid fire round now. Under God and the Pledge of Allegiance would be made unconstitutional. Doctors and nurses who refused to give abortions would no longer be allowed to deliver babies. And people would emigrate to New Zealand because they couldn't homeschool their kids. And for some unknown reason, euthanasia would become more common. And I know what you're thinking, what the fuck? And also why New Zealand? Safe to say none of these things came true, but that didn't stop focus on the family from spreading this type of messaging for years to come. So yay us. Eventually Dobson stepped down from the organization and left in new hands, but he's gone on to do other things solo that are just as concerning. Meanwhile, his organization has grown exponentially and their efforts have been overwhelmingly problematic the entire time. With a founder who has a background in psychology and an unwavering belief that being gay apparently comes from an identity crisis, it's not surprising to learn that Focus on the Family has leaned heavily on pseudoscience and twisting research to spread their homophobic messaging. Throughout the years, they have cherry-picked research to support their abhorrent use of conversion therapy and their never-ending crusade to prevent same-sex couples from adopting children. 
which is pretty counterproductive to their never abortion arguments, but hey, what are conservative evangelists without some horrible contradictions that they never seem to notice? Over the years, the organization's use of actual scientific research has raised quite a few eyebrows, especially from the researchers themselves. In 2006, when James Dobson was still running the organization, he decided to pen an article for Time that invoked 30 years of social science evidence that same-sex couples were harmful to child development and children did best when raised by their married mother and father. There was just one little itty bitty tiny problem. Um, there wasn't actually evidence that said this, at least no evidence that had done their research correctly. Most of the research brought up by Focus on the Family didn't even include same-sex couples at all. They were usually comparing two-parent heterosexual households to single parents. And in case you're wondering, that's not at all the same thing as comparing two-parent heterosexual households to two-parent same-sex households. But that's apparently the types of studies they were using, just so that you're aware of these supposed facts. But Dobson and Focus on the Family know that, he's a psychologist after all. They just hope their followers don't realize it. And how do they do this? Well, by cherry picking quotes from studies that they don't provide links to and barely even source. Though they are sure to mention the author's name, so it sounds as legitimate as possible. So in 2006, this is exactly what he did. And almost immediately, the researchers whose studies were used in the articles came out to say that they had been misquoted. One was an NYU sociologist whose research found modest and interesting differences between same sex and different sex parents at the start of their study. However, it later confirmed that parental sexual orientation has no measurable effect on the child's relationship or their development. And the sociologist even went so far as to attend a protest against Focus on the Family. Dr. Judith Stacy said she had been terribly misquoted by Dobson and confirmed that there was no research-based reason to deny the rights of same-sex parents. Of course, that would not stop Focus on the Family and they kept right on pushing with this rhetoric for years. Even to this day, they use any and all research they can get their hands on to prove their point even if they misquote it constantly. So with science supposedly on their side, at least in their own minds, they feel comfortable doing things that most groups don't, like conversion therapy. While other groups have actually apologized for their use of conversion therapy after an onslaught of backlash and proof that it actually does more harm than good, Focus on the Family has just continued to use the pseudotherapeutic method. Since the beginning, Focus on the Family held conferences that claimed they could, quote, help men and women dissatisfied with living homosexually understand that same-sex attractions can be overcome. Every year, the organization spent millions of dollars putting on Love One Out across the world. They were constantly met with protests, but that didn't matter to the organization. Instead of listening to people who said the event was homophobic and hateful, Focus on the Family decided to continue growing the conference out of the false belief that they were actually spreading love. Still, these would eventually get a little too big for the organization itself. Sure, people had to pay money to get in, but when you're spending millions of dollars on just an event, it might be a little too much. So eventually, Focus on the Family had to turn over the reins to another group, Exodus International. Behold your horses, that doesn't mean they're done with their reparative therapy, as they call it. Now, they're just focusing more on individuals rather than large crowds. Ironically, this means they can continue their work in the background without as many watchful eyes. Maybe they know this benefit, maybe they don't. Either way, they push on. After all, their belief is that no one is born gay and people can be repaired. So why would they stop? They say that gay is just an artificial construct that you shouldn't lock yourself into. And hey, even if you can't completely get rid of your same-sex attraction, they'll teach you how to not act on it because it doesn't have horrible for your mental health written all over it to just hide who you are, right? Every one of their blogs come with a link for a free consultation with a trained and licensed therapist that can help you recenter your life away from sexual attraction to other goals and personal battles. The whole thing just screams out of touch and inconsiderate, but that doesn't seem to matter to them. What's even more terrifying about their belief that people are made gay is their overwhelming use of the groomer rhetoric that we're starting to see everywhere. They say that drag queens are grooming your kids. And again, they misquote research to try and prove these theories. Basically, a research article found that Drag Story Hour was beneficial to kids because it invites them to explore their creativity, imagination, and play. You know, all of the things that children need in child development. It allows children to think for themselves and even break the rules. Once again, something beneficial to children's development. But Focus on the Family decides to take all of this and distort it to say drag queen story hours are merely teaching kids to be gay, which is bullshit and not at all what the research said. They say the authors of these studies have evil intentions. And clearly we have seen this same type of rhetoric lead to horrifying occurrences, including one that happened in Focus on the Family's own backyard. Drag story hours are not grooming your children. Research says this, but organizations like Focus on the Family ignore and twist it to get everyone riled up and on their side. 
It's what they do, and unfortunately, they're quite good at it. So good, in fact, that they've been able to deeply entrench themselves into politics to bring their twisted views to the eyes of the world's most important legislatures and spread their message to voters everywhere. When Obama was elected, the Focus on the Family leader used the strike of his pen to condemn the new president and paint a dark picture of what the future would look like in the United States of America. But what he forgot to mention was his organization's involvement in that future itself. Focus on the Family wasn't going to sit by and let the world fall into ruin and sin as they believed. They had a well-oiled machine of political influence to back them up. Sure, they are legally prevented from campaigning openly for any political candidate, those pesky IRS tax laws for churches, you know, but that doesn't stop them from giving their opinion. In 2004, they launched their very own political leg called the Family Policy Alliance, whose sole mission is to lobby the government and recommend bills that fit their agenda. Back before the legalization of gay marriage, this was their primary focus. They did everything they could to stop gay marriage being legal. They sent out pamphlets, lobbied the government, and of course, appeared constantly on their radio and television programs. Of course, you can't forget the fact that they often promised not to vote for members of Congress that didn't do what they were told. With a massive following, it's a very credible threat. Through the years, their influence has grown to terrifying heights as they donate to extremist religious groups that share their dream of eliminating all access to abortion and dismantling marriage equality. In fact, from just 2011 to 2015, the group donated nearly $7 million to 37 different organizations to reach these goals. And if they can't convince the people that are already in politics to vote their way, that's no problem. They have their own handy academy that trains Christian men and women called to public service. It's called the Statesman Academy, and it has a much bigger impact on politics than you might think. Since its development in 2016, they have trained more than 150 people from 35 states. In just 2020, 52 people who had attended their one-week Christian training program had been elected into office. Some of them have been responsible for some of the most talked about legislation in the last four years, including heartbeat bills, fairness in girls' sports bills, and even the absolutely insane dismemberment abortion ban. And yes, that last one literally bans dismembering fetuses in the womb for an abortion, which isn't a thing in the first place. As for the fairness in girls' sports bills, these are the same ones that are advocating for gender checks that are incredibly invasive and frankly horrifying to keep transgender girls out of literal sports for children. It's children, and they're literally advocating for checking their private parts. Like, I'm just saying, and if we take the politics out of it, you know, and just for a second, just sit back and go, hmm, someone wants to be able to let an administrator take my child and make them remove their pants so that they can see my child's genitals. If we just think about that contextually for a moment, do we not realize how that's just a little bit fucky, a little bit disturbing? No, I think that's disgusting, but that's apparently things they advocate for. Now, if you've heard about any of these, it's probably safe to assume that you have Focus on the Family's political arm to thank for it, at least in part. To add some more terror to their political power, they just have to sprinkle in their undying loyalty to the orange man himself, Mr. Donald Trump. As he spewed on his idea that he actually won an election he undoubtedly lost, they were right beside him pushing the same narrative. When the inauguration eventually came around for the actual president of the United States, Joe Biden, they initiated a massive inauguration prayer group, hoping the country would not soon meet its demise. Sure, it's not as dramatic as the insane letter written by Dobson when Obama was elected, but it's still dramatic as hell. But the world didn't come crumbling down when Joe Biden was elected, at least not for focus on the family. When Roe v. Wade was overturned, they celebrated as abortion is yet another aspect of society that they had worked so hard to crush for years. And before we take a moment to specifically talk about their viewpoints on abortion and what they've done to essentially not allow people to take care of their bodily autonomy, let's take a moment to thank today's sponsors. So I thought today's sponsor was gonna be a particularly spicy one. And I think it's really fitting because I just know it's probably gonna piss off focus on the family. Today's episode is sponsored by Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. You can discover stories about second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, and hot and heavy hookups. 
Dipsy has stories for straight and queer listeners and 56% of stories are voice acted by people of color. New content is released every single week. So in between listening to your favorite stories, you can find something new to explore. They also have soothing sleep stories, wellness sessions, and sexy stories that you can read. So let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, or heat things up with a partner. And for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash casket. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipsestories.com slash casket, dipsystories.com slash casket. Now, when it comes to any hyper-Christian organization, especially one that is so vigilant about the traditional life and supposed family values, you can expect to see many anti-abortion efforts. Focus on the family are no different, but they have gone about it a little bit differently. Instead of the typical protests or little newsletters they send out to their followers, Focus on the Family has instead put their money where their mouths are and they have a fuck ton of money to spare. So much so that they've bought ads for the damn Super Bowl. And that's right. Back in 2010, the organization shelled out the big bucks and hired Tim Tebow to deliver a pro-life ad spot on the most watched television event anywhere with nearly 100 million watchers. Years prior, CBS had banned advocacy commercials during the game, but for some strange reason, they decided this one would be fine. And to be fair, to a degree, I do get their reasoning. If you want something to be seen, putting it on during the Super Bowl is a wonderful idea. But at the same time, it's not like people really want to be arguing about this issue in between beer commercials or a football game. Uh, don't forget like infamous GoDaddy commercials. Is that still a thing? I didn't watch the Super Bowl, so let me know. Or is the Super Bowl this weekend? I literally don't know. Like uh, go go sports, go team go. I don't I don't know. Throw throw the ball, get get the goal. Rah rah rah. But anyway, Focus on the Family absolutely milked the spot and they even claimed years later that the commercial had saved lives. This of course is also coming from the same group that continuously lobbies against Planned Parenthood and actively supports crisis pregnancy centers, which are solely focused on tricking desperate people. When Donald Trump got in trouble for separating children from parents at the borders a few years ago, Focus on the Family stepped in to address a whole separate issue after Planned Parenthood released a tweet denouncing the policy. According to Focus on the Family, Planned Parenthood permanently separates children from parents and is quoted, the most dangerous place for a child to be. But to do that, we also just need to ignore the fact that Planned Parenthood is responsible for providing life-saving quality care to people all across the country, including people who are pregnant. Without them, there would be a lot more issues since they are kind of needed to address the horrid inequalities of the American healthcare system that, you know, groups like Focus on the Family just decided to adamantly avoid discussing or even helping with. If they were really about making families thrive, you would think that they would put more of a focus on helping people who are pregnant and terrified rather than tricking them into crisis pregnancy centers. You know, like the thing that they do right now. They provide manuals that suggest bringing abortion-minded or abortion-vulnerable people into the centers to show them ultrasounds and change their minds. This tactic has been proven not to work and it's usually done just to waste the precious time of people searching to receive abortions in states that have strict time restrictions. And when you think about it that way, it's really shitty, isn't it? Many of these people had made appointments with the crisis pregnancy centers under the guise that they would be provided abortions. And of course, that's not what really happened. They are one of the top donators to these facilities that have only started to grow since the fall of Roe last year. And again, while Focus on the Family does provide things like marriage counseling to help families, they don't provide anything that are actually there to really help the children. They aren't providing housing costs, food, healthcare, childcare, any of that to their followers. Just guidance, that's it. Through the years since the first radio show of James Dobson, Focus on the Family has grown to terrifying amounts of power. But one of the scariest things is that they've done so relatively quietly. Usually we hear about other organizations when it comes to religious groups and politics, but Focus on the Family's pull is just as strong. While Dobson spread his message in a loud, controversial manner, the new leader has leaned towards a softer approach that almost makes you more comfortable. But it's still the same group with the same messages and the same goals. When we see violence uptick against members of the LGBTQ community or hear the horrors of conversion therapy, this is one of the groups that's perpetuating that. Focus on the family is a misnomer. They aren't focused on families, they're focused on themselves. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I wanna thank you for spending some of your time here with me today. I know there's a million and a half things you could be doing, and yet some of it's here with me. So thank you for that. And as always, I look forward to seeing you in the next episode, but goodbye for now.